Welcome to the Money is Emotional podcast with Christine Lukin, the financial dignity coach. In this podcast, we help you recover a positive and peaceful relationship with your personal finances. We do this by bringing together wise money management with emotional intelligence. Join us for this journey where we navigate our relationship with money as Christine Lucan draws from years of experience and guest experts to help you get to the root of your money issues. Hello and welcome to Money is Emotional with your host, Christine Lucan. Christine, it is good to be back with you. What's up? Same here. Um, I don't know. We were just talking about fishing before we started, yes. which was fun. <laughs> yeah. It, well, I'm a little concerned about your friend and her anger management. I know. I know. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know. Yeah, Nicole, well. Nicole, if you're listening, we were talking about you and our uh, escapades with fly fishing for salmon in Alaska. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, apparently she took care of business after she caught her first salmon and put it out of its misery. And, and I'm sure that you enjoyed a feast that night because of that. We did. We did. Yeah. But I, I think, um, I think it might've given grandpa some flashbacks because he, as she was wailing on the fish <laughs> to put it out of its misery, he said, good God, Nicole, we're not at war. <laughs> she was. She had this personal vendetta against salmon for some reason. I had salmon pate last week, and it was terrible. <laughs> Take this. <laughs> Sorry. I don't think I've ever had salmon pate, and I don't think I want to. It sounds like it's just put in a blender. I don't know. I mean, I've had salmon patties. I'm not sure if that's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, any fish patty, I guess. I don't know. I'm a SpongeBob fan. I think there's... Something in there. Anywho, uh, yeah. So, but no, that was, it was great. And I, it sounds like a great experience. And uh, most yeah. people have to have money for experiences like that, right? Yes. Which leads I us highly recommend <laughs> that people put Alaska on their bucket list if they have not been. Yeah. And it's here's the kicker awesome. I haven't been. And I love fishing and I love salmon. Mm, and yeah. I just love, I love mountains. And so I, I really need to get to Alaska at some point because it's just all the pictures I've seen are gorgeous. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, speaking of money and emotions and yes. wailing on fish, what are we talking about today? <laughs> well, today I'm actually revealing the financial dignity formula that oh. I use with all of my clients. So, you know, in my 15 years of coaching, I've developed what I like to call my proprietary formula. Mm -hmm. It's proprietary, but it's it's not secret. <laughs> and this is what I use with my clients to create lasting financial dignity. And it's actually what I personally have used to build my net worth into the millions. And it's the same formula I use with my clients who are, they're paying off staggering amounts of debt and massively increasing their net worth. And it's, it's kind of crazy because with my high income clients, it's not uncommon for me to see a change in net worth between 30 and 50,000 over six months. Now I can't guarantee that, but it happens a lot, which is yeah. crazy. Hmm. All right. Crazy uh, good. Yeah. Crazy good. And, and <laughs> we're talking about the 11 herbs and spices that yes. make up this, this uh, formula, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So well, I can I'm, read I'm it. Here. Yeah, well, I'll read you the formula and you'll be like, hmm, okay. Then we'll walk through each of the steps. So the financial dignity formula is RM plus PP plus DM plus ES times I. Oh, boy. <laughs> so there will be a quiz at the end. No, I'm sure, I should have written that down. <laughs> I really should have been taking notes. This is, a, this is a flashback for me for school. Like, I'm just like, this is going to be on the test. What was? What? Did you already uh, pay it? Shoot. <laughs> I'm going to talk to my friends about it now. Uh, oh, man. I, I, please don't make me sell for X. I'm going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. We're going to explain each step of the formula. And, okay. and it, won't, it will not be on the map test. So, you know, the first component is RM. And this is not going to be a surprise to you. This is about your relationship with money. Yeah, and okay. making sure that it's positive. Now, it's kind of funny because sometimes when people first come into my world and I say, I'm going to help you improve your relationship with money, they kind of look at me sort of 
funny. You know, they're like, mm-hmm. wait a minute, what do you mean? I have a relationship with money? Yes. Yes, you do. But a lot of financial professionals just give you this list of actions to take, right? They say, all right, if you want to get your money crap together, here's the list of things you got to do. And if you just work down the list, it'll be fine. You know, then you'll get this result that you want. And the problem is that as people are trying to work down this list, they are encountering these emotional money triggers that are largely unconscious. And we talked a lot about this in episode number two, about why money is so emotional. And Mm -hmm. we also talked about it in the episode about your money stories. And so the problem is if we don't uncover these emotional triggers and these stories, then it's almost like we're fighting against this invisible force that's pulling us in the wrong direction, right? So consciously we're saying, I want to do better with money, but we've almost got this magnet that's warring with us, right? So Mm -hmm. our conscious mind is saying, this is what I want. And the unconscious mind, because of whatever stories there are from the past or, you know, different money traumas, defects in your, you know, your money blueprint, it's pulling you in the opposite direction. And so many times people will beat themselves up and they'll say, what is wrong with me that I can't do this? Mm -hmm. And I always tell them like, that's the wrong question. The right question is what happened to me? What happened to me that's causing me to have this trigger around money. And so if we don't deal with these things, if we don't deal with the root, it's going to keep coming back. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of personal finance books, they're basically dealing with the fruit instead of the root. Mm -hmm. So they're saying like, okay, well, if you want more money, don't, Don't spend so much money. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah. The problem is if you are sad and lonely and shopping makes you feel good, you know, you can fight against that unconscious tendency for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. But unless you deal with that root, it's always going to come back. And, You've probably had the same experience that I have where you see this weed in your yard and you try to pull it out and it like breaks right at the surface, right? So yep. you've got this you've got this two foot weed, you pull it out and your initial thought is like, okay, well, at least I don't have to look at this weed, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> at least this eyesore is out of my mulch bed. Well, we all know if you don't get that root, it's coming back. It's just a matter of time. Christine, Christine, (laughs) we did not plan this, but literally, (laughs) literally, it was like four days ago. I had a a couple of boys that were working in my yard and I said, okay, these, you know, here's this weed popper. You just, you know, you got to put it in there, pop it out and it, you know, pulls it out by the root, so on and so forth. Well, it's like a little blade that you really just kind of stick next to the weed and then you pry Mm -hmm. it out. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it works really effectively. If you use it right, the problem (laughs) is that I went out there like an hour later and I'm looking at these weeds that they've got piled up and, and it's just, they're dandelions, right? So it's just the leaves and it's, and they said, we found a faster way to do it. And what they were doing is they were putting like right on the edge of the thing and then sliding it sideways to cut the top off. (laughs) So they they left every (laughs) root, every one of (laughs) <laughs> the root was still sitting in there. And now it's like, well, now we're not going to go around and find them all. I'm like, okay, well. Oh, geez. <laughs> wait for them to grow back, and then we'll just do it all again. It's like, if you're trying to find an easier, faster way, that's not going to work. Like you said, you've got to get yeah. to the root of the issue and do a little bit more work. It's going to take a little right. bit of sweat, maybe. Mm-hmm. But it's going to pay off in the long run. Yeah. Well, and the transformation that I see in people is is pretty crazy. Now, a lot of my clients, 
they want to be kept confidential, right? Because a lot of times it's embarrassing, the messes that they've gotten themselves into. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I do have certain clients who are happy to give me testimonials and say like, hey, yes, use me as an example. Yeah. And so one of those clients uh, for me was Betsy. And she owned her own business. She still does. She's a um, super sharp business owner. However, when it came to money, when we first started working together, she would literally work herself into a panic attack mm. about her finances. Like she didn't even want to look at it. She thought that personal finance was hard because math was hard for her you know, in school. And she also had parents that told her, well, you know, you're not great at math. Money's just hard for you. And she internalized that and she believed it. And so she avoided it. And therefore there was financial chaos because <laughs> she was trying to avoid it and not look at it. Yeah. But it was, you know, after going through this process of uncovering these roots and healing them, I mean, it was almost like she was a completely different person when it came to money. You know, she felt empowered and in control, and she now has a very positive and peaceful relationship with her money, and her business actually took off to the next level of success, probably at least in part because she was being a good boss of her money, both personally and professionally. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right. So the second piece of the formula, that is the PP, that is the prosperity plan. So as you know, I'm not a fan of traditional budgets. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is I really see like two big problems with traditional budgeting. Most of them are cookie cutter type plans. So, you know, you go and you read a book and they've got this sample budget in there and maybe there are recommended percentages. Like we recommend that you spend between 20 and 30% of your take home pay on housing. And we recommend you spend no more than 10% on food, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what works for me might not work for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many different factors as far as, you know, where are you on your life's journey? You know, are you just starting out in your 20s or are you just getting ready to retire in your 60s? Do you have kids? Do you not have kids? You know, what part of the country do you live in? You know, if you're living in New York City or California, you're probably going to need a larger percentage to put towards housing. Right. Um, and the, the example that I always use, actually, it's kind of funny that we brought up Nicole, my best friend, because I always use this example when I'm talking about this. You know, if someone tells you like, hey, you should be spending approximately 10 percent of your income on food. Well, she's got a bunch of kids and a husband. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, for me, it's just like just me and my husband. And, you know, all of her boys are teenagers she's probably going to need more than 10%. Yeah. And and that would might be way too much for for Nick and I. So you know, we we've got to look at this in such a way to say I can see what's suggested here, but is that going to work for me? Do I need to tweak this? Do I need to change this? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean you same thing with your household budget, right? Um you guys may need two bedrooms, maybe three, because you have an office. Right. If they've got a grip of kids, they're going to need more than more than just a two bedroom home, right? So, absolutely. It, it, yeah. So, I mean, it, it does. I, I I get the point, and I agree hundred percent. That's it, you just can't be. It's not a one size fits all thing. Right. And you know the other thing about traditional budgets is that many of them are extreme, and they're about deprivation. So I love to say that there is no financial keto in my world. <laughs> as, as someone who's been on keto before, uh-huh, I get it. <laughs> totally get it. Right? So it's like we're not cutting out all the fun. 
what we're doing is we are creating a balanced plan that we can live with because if you take someone that's completely out of control with no plan and you put them into something that is extremely regimented, at some point they're going to get tired of it. And when they quit the regimented plan, the only other thing that they know is to be completely out of control and have no plan. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not helpful. So, you know, I want people to enjoy the journey. You know, some folks will say, well, you know, you'd get faster, you'd get out of debt faster if you just buckled down and did it. And it's like, well, I don't want to live like I'm poor for three years while I pay off my student loans. You know, Mm -hmm. these are the kinds of things that my clients tell me. It's like, yeah, we do want to get rid of that. And it is a priority, but we do also want to enjoy life while we're doing this. So... The other thing is when you look at a budget versus a prosperity plan, a budget is simply dealing with income and expenses. The personalized prosperity plans that I'm creating for my clients, it incorporates the full picture. So yes, it is about the income and the spending, but it's also about saving, investing, protecting your financial future, uh, the different goals that you have. So it's it's more holistic and all-encompassing than a budget. So beware of extreme and mm-hmm. one-size-fits-all budgets. Got it. So the third portion of the financial dignity formula, DM, this is all about debt mastery. No, debt is not the devil. However, You should use it wisely and in moderation. You don't need to cut up your credit cards unless you're completely out of control with them. And there are some people who probably shouldn't have a credit card. (laughs) However, it's really a matter of figuring out how much debt do you feel comfortable carrying? When I'm working with my clients, we're really focusing on what I call the unproductive debt. For me, that's the credit card debt. It's the debt that doesn't have any kind of asset tied to it, and it's usually high interest. Mm -hmm. That's really where we put our focus. And yes, sometimes it does help for clients to temporarily stop charging and, you know, just use debit cards and cash if they're really out of control. But most of the time, if they're tracking their spending through their prosperity plan and you know they've got this mindfulness around it they can still continue to use the same payment methods unless they feel like they're getting out of control yeah so for me i tell people you want to use debt strategically you know personally i really don't want to have any debt That's just my preference. My husband feels the same way. It's not to say that we wouldn't go into debt in the future if, you know, we had an opportunity to buy a a property, you know, for Mm -hmm. ourselves or for investment or to buy into a business. However, for us, it would be because it's helping us to build wealth, not because it's helping us to spend yeah. On things that we may or may not even need. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, credit cards are fine for cash flow purposes. In fact, if you use them properly, then you can actually benefit. And we did talk about that in one of the previous episodes. But, you know, one of my clients, a couple, uh, Liz and Jeremy, they paid off $50,000 in debt mm. in six months. And we improved their cash flow by almost $6,500 a month Jeez, (laughs) because of refinancing. So we did a combination of refinancing and and paying things down, but we didn't just refinance. You know, they also made some major progress on that debt as well. And Mm -hmm. I always tell people, think about how much money every month is going towards debt payments. 
And if you didn't have those debt payments, what could you do with that money instead? Yeah. And just thinking about that is really motivating, right? Yeah, you know, we all know, you know, people say like, oh, yeah, yeah, I should pay off my debt. But that's not very motivating, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So if we think about, okay, let's look at this interest that's going out every month. Let's look at these payments that are going out every month. If those were gone, oh, my God, what awesome things could we do with that money? Yeah. And that's really motivating. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, because in in their example, I don't know their whole thing. You just you just said the in fifty thousand in debt, sixty five hundred dollars a month. I mean, that's that's yeah. huge for maybe they have maybe that was just credit card debt. Now they have student loans that they want to knock down. That that's a huge amount going every month. Even if they only use half of that, right, thirty two fifty yeah. per month yeah. to to knock down those student loans. That's quick, or. Like you said, you and your husband don't want to go into debt, but if you found a property to invest in, you had something that you wanted to invest in, $6,500 goes a long way in investing in a business or into a, into a property that you could use as a business. I mean, there's, there's so many things you could do with that for wealth generation instead of mm-hmm. just, you know, wasting it all on that interest that, that gets all of us at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Excuse me. Yes, you. Thank you so much for listening to the Money is Emotional podcast. We hope you're enjoying it so far. If you have any questions or would like to talk more about this topic, you can find us at www.christinelukin.com and all of our social media platforms are listed in the show notes. Yeah, I don't want to go there again. I can tell you that much. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> So the the fourth piece of the formula, yes, this is emotionally charged savings. Hmm. And I'm not sure if you and I have talked about this. I don't think so. I was going to say, I don't don't think I've heard this before. So a lot of financial professionals will tell you to exercise your willpower to save money. But there's a problem with willpower. It's not very reliable. And... Multiple things can drain it throughout the day. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you've had a particularly rough day and your kids have tested your patience and you had a frustration with your coworker and you just stuffed it and didn't really, you know, didn't tell them what you really wanted to say, (laughs) (laughs) you know, your, your spouse made you mad, whatever. By the time you get to the end of the day, If you've had a rough day, that's when you tuck into that pint of Ben and Jerry's or hop onto Amazon and, Mm -hmm. you know, do some emotional spending, right? Because that willpower has been depleted. The good news is there are some things that are more powerful than willpower. And that is an emotional charge that makes you excited to save. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a real quick example, and I'm not sure if we've used this before or not, because I I feel like I talk about this a lot of times when I'm guesting on other people's podcasts, especially with financial planners, because we like to talk about retirement. Yeah. And for most of us, that's probably the biggest goal that we're ever going to save for is retirement. And so a lot of times... It seems like so far off into the future that it can be hard to motivate ourselves to be saving for our retirement. Mm -hmm. So it does help to really think about what exactly we want retirement to look like. And so for me, I know it's going to be near a beach. I used to say Hawaii. Now I'm thinking it might be Venice because I've spent so much time down in Venice, Florida. But like when I think about, okay, when I'm like completely done working, when when Nick is done working, I can see the places where I would want to live, you know, the beaches that I would want to go to, the restaurants I'd want to eat at. You know, it's like I can see it all because I've been down there, right? And I can get really excited about it and be like, okay, then you know, that can shift from just being vacation to be like, that's where I live. Yeah. That's awesome. But sometimes just the positive picture pulling us forward 
might not be enough to get us motivated to action. So we can actually like double charge our goal with both positive and negative emotions. And what I mean by this is let's imagine what would happen if I didn't achieve that goal. And I didn't have the retirement that I wanted to in a tropical location. Mm -hmm. So several years ago, I was looking for a retirement home for my mother-in-law who has since passed of cancer. And so I went and toured a couple different retirement communities. There was one that I walked into that like the minute I walked in, I wanted to walk out Mm -hmm. because it was not good. But I was polite and I stayed for the tour and it left such a visceral impression on me. Like every time I drive by it still, I like kind of shudder a little bit. I'm just like, oh, like I wouldn't send anybody there. And what's interesting is every time I think about, okay, it's time for me to, you know, make my contribution to my solo 401k. How much am I going to contribute? Well, I have this picture of the beach that's pulling me forward, Mm -hmm. but I also have this, this negative vision chasing me at my heels of that not so great retirement community. Cause I'm like, if I don't save enough, I'm not going to get to retire near a beach. I'll have to stay in Cincinnati where the winters are terrible and they're cold and they're miserable. And I might have to live in one of those kinds of retirement communities. Like Mm. that would be terrible. Right. So it's like, I don't just have the emotional pull forward, but I also have the repellent from the backside. And both of those (laughs) are actually pushing me in the direction that I want to go. Yeah. So ever since, It's kind of funny because ever since I went and looked at that retirement community, we have maxed out our retirement contributions every year since then. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, we were close previously, but, you know, sometimes I'd be like, yeah, I don't know if we're going to put into our IRAs this year. Nope. It's it's happening. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's different for every person because everybody has different types of saving and investing goals that they have. And we can use this type of imagination to create this emotional pull that's going to get us to our goals faster, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So the final piece of the formula is the I, and this is all about investing. Now, this isn't about investing in the stock market. This is about investing in yourself and your financial future. So if your personal finances aren't where you want them to be, you're going to need to invest time, effort, attention, And yes, even possibly money in order to rectify the situation. But what's interesting is you have to also think about the flip side of this. What's the cost of doing nothing? Mm. Right? Continued. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like stress, arguing with your spouse or partner, feeling frustrated, all those interest payments on debt. Lack of sleep. Yeah. I mean, feeling like you're on that hamster wheel, no matter how much money you make, that you're still just treading water, right? And so the old formula, (laughs) which most people operated under before they decided to fix their finances, I know because I did it. And that was, I ignored the problem. Plus, I thought more income would fix it. Spoiler alert, it did not. (laughs) No plan. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And negative beliefs about money. And 
that equaled me not being in a good place, either financially or emotionally. So when we talk about the financial dignity formula, it's that RM plus PP plus DM plus ES times I. So your relationship with money, your prosperity plan, debt mastery, emotionally charged savings, everything gets timesed by that investment in yourself. And that's that's really what success looks like. Yeah. And I had to do all of these things myself when I hit financial rock bottom, you know? Yeah, we talked about in the first episode, yes, I did have a mentor who was my dad, but a lot of this stuff I figured out by myself, you know? And when you think about, sure, you could decide to DIY your finances. And you could figure out how to do it yourself. Or when you work with a financial coach like me, you can accelerate your progress because you've got somebody who's already been there, who's already done it, who has the formula, and who has led thousands of people successfully through that process. Yeah, I think I liken it to when I first started. You know, when, when my wife and I were first married, we won't even talk about the debt situation, but just our taxes, right? Mm -hmm. I did them because it was easy. It was A plus B minus whatever Uncle Sam wanted to take equals what I got left, right? It's pretty easy forms <laughs> to fill out. It was pretty easy to figure it out and, and just be done with it. But when I started my own company, and then I was also a partner in another company that I, mm -hmm. I own part of, it gets complicated. Yeah. And that's when, you know, if I continued to try to do it myself, I would miss so many opportunities for right. tax deductions, tax reduction, for what what people might term loopholes, which they're not loopholes, they're actually written into the tax code. But I don't know the tax code. No, I, I, I leaned don't on. Yeah, I leaned on a professional to do my taxes for me, and it was an investment in myself, just like you were talking about. Number one, I invested. It was the money that I invested in myself, and the fact that I didn't have to take all the time that it would have taken me to do all the research, to do all the things that a CPA does really well for a living, right? They already know this stuff. Uh, and so it was a no brainer for me at that point because I wasn't going to get it right. And I think that, yeah. that's what I, that's what I liken it to when you're talking about this, because it is tough and yeah. people don't know all the, the strategies and all the loopholes, if you will, for the things that they can do, which you do. Right. Yeah. Well, and even in the things that we talked about that are part of the formula, there's so many subtleties and there's so much personalization that goes into what I do for my clients that like, even if I handed this formula over to another financial coach, they're not going to do it exactly the same way as me. And there's going to be yeah. things where, you know, I wouldn't even think to tell them because I've been doing this so long. Yeah. Like, I couldn't even tell you how I know certain things when I talk to people and I can just like, I can perceive these emotional money triggers from like a mile away just because I've been doing this for yeah, so long. Exactly. It's experienced. <laughs> right. I mean, people are like, you have this like mystical talent for doing this. <laughs> and it's like, I think I've just been doing it so long. And it's like, I, I couldn't even tell you how to do it. You know, yeah. it's like I, I couldn't even train you to do it. It's just, you know, it's just one of those things that once you've done it for so long, it's just part of who you are. But I also think it's really refreshing to have a fresh set of eyes looking at your numbers. You know, like you talked about with your your tax professional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is why I have other money professionals on my team because they can look at different pieces of my personal finances and they see things that I don't see. Yeah. And, and that's, that's very valuable. And they can also give suggestions and wisdom in a way it's in a different way because they're not emotionally attached to your situation. Yeah. If that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. So right. you know what, if, 
you're listening and you're, you know, a high income professional couple, divorcing woman, and you're ready for lasting financial dignity, let's talk. Because I've opened up some good chunks of time in my calendar for the next month to talk to you. So you can set up a time for us to chat and we'll see if your situation is a good fit for financial dignity coaching. So you can hop over to my website, christinelukin.com forward slash apply. And if you're one of those people who does prefer a DIY approach, you know, maybe you're not high income, the financial dignity formula is baked into my courses. And you'll want to check out my signature course, which is Financial Dignity on Demand. And if you use the promo code PODCAST, all small caps, you'll actually get an exclusive listener discount, and that is financialdignityondemand.com. Awesome. Christine, thank you. This is great. I, I loved it. And uh, now we have the secret formula. You got the secret formula. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we will talk like, to you again shh, soon. Tell yeah, everybody. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, shh, tell everybody. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to our next conversation. Me too. All right. And we want to also thank you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Money is Emotional podcast with Christine Lucan. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Christine comes out with a new podcast, it will show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review, as this will actually help others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Money is Emotional, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Money is Emotional podcast. To get in touch, visit our website at www.christinelukin.com or drop us a line at hello at christinelukin.com. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Christine Lukin. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing or tax advice. Always seek the advice of your advisor, tax professional, or other qualified financial professional with any questions you may have regarding your personal finances.